If you're listening to this message today, um, it is being recorded not in a live audience, but rather in my office uh, as a uh, replacement for uh, the the message that was not recorded on Sunday due to technical difficulties. Uh, but I'm going to try to imagine that uh, um, that you're sitting before me here and uh, I'm preaching this message um, to an audience. Um, uh, so so that, uh, but I want you to understand uh, kind of where we're coming from here. Well, today is uh, week two in a series of messages and activities that are entitled, May Those Who Follow Find Us Faithful. And the scripture we're holding up as our guiding light in this series and campaign is found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And I thought it might be a good idea if we just kind of read it together again each week. Because, well, some of you parents know this, but in children's church each week your children are being taught this same passage. In fact, some can write this entire passage out from memory already. Uh, They've got it completely memorized, and many others are on their way to doing the same. And that might be a good thing for you to do as well. Do it together as a family. And so I'm thinking we should make a point uh, to kind of emphasize it in this service as well. So we're going to put the passage up on the screen and see how we do all together line by line. So here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Well, that's the theme scriptures we're holding up each week because it teaches the life of God's people whose first priority as adults is to be is, is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. Now, Jesus would later confirm this teaching as a way of life for God's people when he taught his disciples, saying this in Matthew 23, 37 through 40, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Years ago, uh, while working with the youth at the Fortville Christian Church, uh, we had some youth that were really, they really took this concept to heart, and one high school boy started a trend that soon caught on with others, and his name was Kerry Sherritt. And on his locker door at school, he placed a little three or four inch circular sticker with nothing printed on except the number three. And to him, it was a daily reminder of his priorities. The Lord is first, others are second, and then himself. And when people would ask him, what's up with the number three sticker, Kerry, he'd explain, well, that's my goal in life, to be number three. Jesus then went on to teach us in the rest of that previous verse, in verse 37, that to keep these two commandments, you are, in fact, keeping them all. For all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so that's the first priority of God's people. For to be God's people who love God is to obey the commands God has given his people, for they are a guidance as to how God's people should live and be, like a lamp unto their feet and a light unto their path. So God's instruction to his people was, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children, which we talked about last week, which in part was that they are, as our children, uh, they're not our top priority. Although we love them dearly, but rather our top priority is is God. That as God's people, He is our priority. Then to build on that impression, God goes on to instruct on how to instruct His children. Did you catch that? He instructs them on how to instruct. He says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, the title of this series is, May Those Who Follow Find Us Faithful. So let me ask you, church family, is there a lot of talking going on here from these adults who are leading, leading their children into faithfulness? And so, you know, answer this question. What is it that they are talking to their children about? Yeah, God's word, God's commands on how his people are to live, which begs the question of why talk? Why teach? Why teach them these commands? Well, the Bible says, so that life may go well for them so that they might live a long life, so that they might be blessed in the land of promise. Now, I once heard a father questioned by one of his children, isn't it your responsibility as a parent to do things so that your children will be happy? And the Christian father's response was awesome, I thought. He said, no, my divinely appointed purpose as a father is to teach my children to be obedient to God's word, and then that will lead them to a happy life. And that's right, for it is the life lived in Christ, lived in the love of the Lord, lived in obedience to God's word that leads to what Jesus referred to as the abundant life. 
where one day the Master Jesus will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your Master's what, church family? Come and share in your Master's happiness. You know, educators who teach children that, uh, that, that they might be literate not only teach them to read words in a book, but they teach them also to comprehend what it is that they're reading. That means they not only read it, but then they talk about it. And one of my favorite memories of our son-in-law, Jack, who went to be with the Lord about five years ago, was the times that Margie and I were able to visit them in Tennessee and worship with them in their church. And Jack, always the Southern gentleman, and by that I mean his mama taught him to be that, which means he was always opening doors for the women, going out to the parking lot to pull the car up to the church's front door so the ladies didn't have to walk, things like that. Anyway, I'll never forget the first time we did that together. Church had just let out, and we were walking out to get the car to pick the ladies up, and he asked me, so dad... What did you get out of the sermon? And I very intelligently responded with, What? He said, Yeah, Sherry and I do that every week. After hearing God's word, we talk about it as to how it applies to our lives. So, Dad, what did you get out of today's word? You know, I always liked it when he called me Dad. I always liked it that he opened doors for my daughter. But his keeping his word that he would be my daughter's spiritual leader, that was the best. Listen, friends, there needs to be among God's people, young and old alike, to not only read God's word, but listen to God's word, to understand and comprehend not only what it means, but then to go out and live it, which means as Christian adults, we must be spiritual leaders God has called us to be and talk to those who follow us about how to follow the Bible. For to talk is to teach. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. To talk is to teach. So today we're going to hold up the biblical examples of Lois and Eunice. You all know who Lois and Eunice are, don't you? Well, there are a Grammy and a mama, a Grammy and a mama who successfully passed on the baton of faith to the next generation. And of course, the person of faithfulness that we're going to be talking about is Timothy, who, as far as I know, is the only second generation Christian found in the New Testament. Lois and Eunice are the first generation, and then Timothy, who was a youth when they were converted, became the next generation or the second generation Christ follower. And so this is the goal that we've been talking about in this series, the interaction that we want when it comes to being faithful to our youth. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy 1.5, for the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, and here's what he writes, verse 5. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, a careful study of the New Testament will quickly reveal that Timothy is one of the most constant companions of the Apostle Paul. The first reference of Timothy is found in Acts 16 at the beginning of Paul's second missionary journey, where Paul revisits the church in Lystra and Derby that he and Barnabas planted on their first missionary journey. And most Bible scholars believe it possible, probable, in fact, that Timothy's first meeting of the Apostle Paul was on that first missionary journey, when in Acts 14 we read that Paul was dragged outside that city and stoned near to death. Mark Moore, in the College Press commentary on the book of Acts, writes this. He writes, Paul was perhaps knocked unconscious, and it was Lois and Eunice who nursed him back to health, making an indelible imprint, or we might say an indelible impression, on their child, Timothy. I mean, there is little doubt that that first missionary journey is where Lois and Eunice first heard the gospel of grace through Jesus Christ. So it seems probable either way that Paul met Timothy earlier than that first missionary journey earlier on that first missionary journey and, and made a good impression on the possible. But by the second missionary journey, Timothy, who was then perhaps 18 years old, had already made a good reputation as a Christ follower, not only in Lystra, but as far away as Iconium, which was 20 miles away. Now, Timothy not only joined the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey, but he was with him at times on Paul's third, because at times Paul would leave him behind to minister to some other church or do some other task. I mean, Timothy, we know, was often a courier of news of kingdom work, and at times would bring Paul not only the word from the church at Philippi, but generous offerings as well to support Paul's ministry to other churches. Timothy was left by Paul to minister in Ephesus, would co-minister with Paul and others uh, in Athens and Corinth and Thessalonica, and he also accompanied Paul on his last journey to Jerusalem. And so we find Timothy's name throughout the New Testament. And the last mention of Timothy in the New Testament is found in Hebrews 13, where it is reported that Timothy was uh, recently released from prison and that the author of the letter intends to bring Timothy along on a proposed visit. And so, 
There is no doubt that Timothy more than received the baton of faith from his mother and grandmother, for he ran with it in a manner fitting of some of the great heroes of the faith. But here's the question for today. How did all that begin? How did such a successful transfer of faith take place? So that's our question before us this morning here. Where are we to begin transferring our faith to the next generation? Well, well, it's probable that it began when Timothy was very young. I mean, I imagine his mother and grandmother, who were both Jews and worshipers of the one true God, Yahweh, they hadn't been converted to Christ yet. Well, they began by teaching him all the law and the prophets had to say. I mean, they saturated him with the scriptures of the Old Testament, telling and retelling the stories of those biblical heroes of old, stories of faith about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, stories about the great prophets, Elijah, Elijah, and Samuel, stories about the great Exodus led by God's deliverer, Moses, stories of the adventures of a shepherd boy who one day became a great king, King David. Now, today, our little girls look up to Disney princesses. They dress up and they dream and they play act that they're Queen Elsa of Arendelle or Princess Anna or any great number of princesses that grace the Disney screen. And our boys perhaps look upon the superheroes, heroes like Captain America, Thor, Superman, or Batman, who all have great superpowers. Well, maybe not so much Batman, but at least he was rich. But I wonder, did Timothy dress up? Did he carry around a staff with superpowers, play acting that he was the great deliverer of Moses? Did he pretend that he was the shepherd boy David who brought down the enemy of his God, the great Philistine Goliath? You know, did he have a sling? Or did he dream up the greatest of them all, the superhero who had not yet arrived on the scene, the Messiah, the king, who would deliver the kingdom of God from the oppression of Rome? For surely his mother Lois and grandmother Eunice had told him many things about the character and the power of this coming deliverer of God's people. I mean, I imagine Timothy perhaps dreamed and wondered what kind of man this great king would be. And then when Timothy was perhaps 15 years old, a man came to Lystra, a preacher, a man who, who, who was named Paul, who claimed to be an apostle of the Messiah, who spoke of the Messiah and spoke of him as God, a God who had come to earth as a man, a man of great character and compassion, a man of superpowers who would heal diseases and cast out spirits and even raise the dead to life again, a man who, despite all his glory, would be or had been mistreated and falsely accused and crucified by the people he came to deliver. But then he learned that this Messiah was not a man like any other, for this man rose from the dead, proving, therefore, that he was who he said he was, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. What was, the one, what was one to make of all this message that seemed like such good news? Was it to be believed? Well, his mother and grandmother believed it, and would seem the whole event made quite an impression on Timothy as well. But let us not think of this mission of passing on the baton of faith from one generation to the next, that it was an easy one for Lois and Eunice, for Timothy's father was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, and there is no biblical evidence that he was ever a believer. So most likely, there was a competing worldview in Timothy's home. And this isn't the holy city of Jerusalem where these women are teaching this youth. No, it's Lystra, a place where there would be more than just a little temptation for a young man to be pulled astray. But Timothy's mother and grandmother planted the seed of God's truth in him at an early age, and it grew. And in the end, it produced a harvest of faith. And listen, friends, our first assignment as disciple makers is is to deliver our families into the hands of God. You know, we far too often think the goal of our children is to watch them go off from the home church or, you know, to a distant land in their early adult years. I mean, whether that be college or the armed forces or the workplace. And then we wait. We wait in hopes that one day they will return. They'll return to the roots like the prodigal. But you know what is a better goal is? What a greater goal is? Is for them not to go off from the church in the first place. So if you, if you would fill these blanks in, keeping children home, and by home we mean faithful to the church, is greater than receiving them back. Yes, there is something better than bringing the prodigal back from the far country, and that is keeping them home in the first place and a right relationship in their faith. And God's word taught early on has the power to do just that, to keep people close to the Father, as well as return them when they do stray away. 
One Bible commentator wrote, God's word has power. When God formed man from the dust of the earth, the Bible says God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And because of that, we understand that man became a living soul. And it was that living soul that made man distinctive from all the other living things God had created in creation. And when God wrote the Bible, God breathed into it. And the Bible became a distinctive living book as he breathed life into those pages. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. And in Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.14 and 15, Paul gives a warning to Timothy. But within the warning is a compliment to Lois and Eunice. Listen to what he says, beginning in verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says that Lois and Eunice taught Timothy all the way from his infancy. In other words, from the time he was a very small child, they began to incorporate godly principles, and the Word of God had a place in his life. Now, that's a great lesson for parents and grandparents for sure. But listen, if you're an adult that's not married or or, or an adult that doesn't have children, there is a lesson here for you too. Because the Christian faith was not just modeled to Timothy by two blood relatives, but it was also modeled by someone who was not a blood relative. Someone who was willing to make an investment of time and energy to influence Timothy for Christ. And that person was Paul himself who seemingly adopted Timothy as a spiritual son, who most likely made an impression on Timothy on his first missionary journey to Lystra, where he was nearly beaten to death and when Timothy was perhaps 15 years old, but who then later asked Timothy to go along on a second and then a third missionary journey as an apprentice evangelist, which grows into a partnership of sorts as fellow kingdom workers for the next 15 years as Timothy had a first-hand witness of the Apostle Paul in action. And so let me say this, church family, from the church's vision and mission viewpoint, it's going to take more. It's going to take more than new a new children and youth space to be successful in passing on the baton of faith to the next generation. It's going to take Christian adults, some who don't have children and some who have already raised theirs, to be that non-relative that stands in the gap of a child's life that chooses to be the next generation of children's and youth ministry workers that says, I will be the spiritual mentor to that child or that youth. You see, church family, we all know this. We all know this, but let us be reminded. The church building, the children youth space, that is not the church. You are. We are. We are all together making a difference in the kingdom. In 1983, Bonnie Tyler, and many of you Footloose fans uh, will remember this, but in 1983, Bonnie Tyler wrote a song entitled, I Need a Hero. And when we look to the world, well, the truth is most of the world's still looking for their hero. So much so that we must invent Marvel superheroes and, and, and Disney princesses to try and fill that void, to try and fill that need, because real people, well, in time, real people, their reputations get tarnished as we catch a glimpse of their bad temper or their secret sin is made known, which remind us once again that our man-made heroes are none of them perfect, for they all have feet of clay. And that's why the Bible is so important, for you see, it was there in the scriptures that Timothy first learned of the Messiah, a Messiah promised from God, a Messiah who was unconditionally loving, who was all-sacrificing, and a Messiah who was perfect and would never let you down. And because of those continual peaks into the Bible from those earliest of years, Timothy's mind was saturated with visions and dreams. And I think one day he perhaps thought to himself, that Messiah, I want him to be my hero. Now, there are a lot of applications that we could pull out of the examples of Mother Lois and Grandmother Eunice in in the teaching of Timothy. And I suppose we should not forget the influence of Paul as well. And so to help us with the time we have left to us, let's answer these three questions. And the first is, why do we teach? Why do we teach? Well, there are many reasons, but they all should fall under the theme of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, where we read God's instruction to his people. Hear, O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. 
These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Bottom line, we talk and we teach that we may invest and transfer uh, our love, our love for God and the good life that comes with it onto our children. But to expand the why of teaching out a bit, well, we teach the Bible God's word because it teaches moral values and godly ethics. It teaches us old and young alike the Creator's will for our lives. In Psalm 119, 105, the psalmist writes, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. We teach because it feeds their spirit. It fills that void in their hearts that only God can fill. For there is a deep hunger and thirst in all of our hearts, a hunger for righteousness, a thirst for some type of purpose, direction, and meaning. First Peter 2.2 2 says, It is a thirst like newborn babies who crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That the Lord is good. We teach because the word, if God is power, it's powerful in our lives. If we allow it not to go only to our heads, but also to our hearts. It is powerful if we allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in our spirit and soul. The Apostle Paul writes of this to the church folks in Corinth when he writes, What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritually taught words. God's Word also has the power to guard our hearts from temptation and sin. Jesus taught His disciples to pray, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God's Word has the, the power to do that, if it is in our hearts and it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. David in Psalm 119.11 wrote, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And last but not least, we teach God's word that its truth might produce a blessing in the child or the youth's life. Psalm 1.1, which is the first verse of a book of 150 chapters, begins with this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. So, why do we teach the next generation? Because blessed is the one who delights in and meditates on God's word day and night. And that's our hope. I mean, that's our hope for the next generation, that they may share also in the master's happiness. Is it not? Yes, it is. You know, sometimes I hear adult Christians say, well, we're not going to force our religion on our children. They, they will have to make their own choice when they're adults. But I have seen those same parents force their children to go to school and study, go to the doctor and take medicine. I've seen parents even force their kids to play a sport or learn a musical instrument or take classes, all for the reason that these disciplines will help them grow. It'll build them as a person by shaping their body, their mind, and their character. So, so, so why not also the spiritual? You know, when our third child, Sherry, was a freshman in high school, she was taking a class entitled Philosophy of Religion, which when you think about it, in reality, is the government's educational system teaching my child about religion. Well, she came to me one evening and she told me about this class and what she'd been taught. She said, Dad, I know what I believe about our faith, but I'm not sure that what I say I believe is what I believe because I I, I believe it to be right and true, but more so because you and mom believe it to be true. And if it's my faith, then I think I ought to believe what I say I believe. And right now, with all I'm learning, I'm a little confused. What should I do? Well, I gave her an answer, but then I went and asked a mentor for a better answer. Dale Holtzbauer, who at the time was the senior minister at the church we were attending in Fortville, but later would become my preaching ministry professor at Cincinnati Bible College. Anyway, I told him of the situation with Sherry and shared that it kind of shook me a bit. And he said, yeah, all my kids basically went through the same thing. I said, so so what did you tell them? And he said, well, I told them I understand and I thanked them for coming to me. And then I told them I made the same journey myself and that their faith indeed needed to be their faith. But it's a long journey with lots of things to consider. And it's your journey and your destination to decide. But if you would, do me a couple favors. First, let me be your guide. Let me guide you because I know the way. And second, until you get to the end of that journey, trust in what I've already taught you. Because no one on this earth loves and cares about your destination more than I do. And that was great advice. 
and I shared it, and she received it. The second question is, when do we teach? Moses instructed God's people in Deuteronomy 6. He said, when you sit at home, when you travel along the road, when you lie down in the evening, when you get up in the morning, virtually all the time. And I think this is, this is an instruction that's really built for our fast-paced, frantic world that, that we live in because in our world's culture, time is perhaps the most valued commodity. So Moses' instruction is perfect for our world because basically what Moses is saying is you talk to your children, you teach your children as you go, as you go about life. So for the Christ follower, it works like this. Whatever you do, wherever you're going as a family, well, first you take Jesus along, right? Because he's part of the family. But secondly, we take the word of God with us as well to be our guiding light. That way, whatever the situation or whatever the opportunity, we can determine God's will for our life. So we're at a restaurant and we're getting ready to leave. And one of the kids wants to know how we determine the tip. Well, we can explain how God would want us to be generous and then show them how to calculate generous and explain to them our tip is a way to bear witness of Christ's love for others, even more so or especially so if the food and the service wasn't all that good. Or how we handle our finances, how we drive the family car, the language we use or don't use when some driver cuts us off. All these are opportunities to teach God's word and how it guides our life. We need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. You know, our granddaughter, Becca, is learning manners from her mommy and daddy. I mean, they're really emphasizing good manners. Manners like coughing into your elbow or not talking with food in your mouth, using your fork and spoon instead of your fingers, things like that and others. For instance, the other day, an adult who shall not be named to protect the guilty dropped something or did something wrong, and they said, oh, shoot. And little Becca jumped right in and said, ah, that's a bad word. Mommy says, we don't say that because that's bad. Do you see? We don't do that because it's bad. Two and a half years old, and she not only knows the law, but she knows the reason for the law. And she's learning as she and her parents do life together. Now, someone may say, well, I'm not sure my kids are hungry for God's word, or they're not that thirsty for spiritual water. Really? Really? It's been my observation that kids are hungry and thirsty for whatever their parents are hungry and thirsty for. I mean, my wife, and by the way, the reason you get so many Becca the granddaughter stories, so I mean, is because I get them every day, okay? As my wife, Margie, is the everyday nanny for our two newest grandkids, and, and every day she gets up and she packs her lunch, and first she makes a sandwich of some sort, and usually something healthy like turkey or chicken, and then she adds some veggies to warm up in the microwave. More often than not, it's cauliflower, and then some sort of snack or treat. This week, the veggie sticks because, well, they sound healthy, right? I mean, they're good, but they sound healthy. Every day this week, she's taking a lunch like that. And every day she comes back home with some sort of story about lunchtime, and she's still marveling about it six hours later. And it's basically the same story every day. Margie has her lunch and Becca has hers. And usually Becca's lunch is usually a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or, you know, maybe maybe some fruit or some yogurt. She, 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 she loves that stuff. All those things she chooses, it's stuff she likes, okay? But partway through into lunch, she looks at her Grammy and, and she looks at what Grammy is eating and she says, what are you eating, Grammy? What's that? Well, that's cauliflower. You want some? Sure. So she'll taste it, and then it's the same thing every day. She eats it, and she says, Mmm, that's good. Then half a Grammy's cauliflower is now magically hers. And then it's on to the next thing. What's that? Can I have a taste of what you're eating? Can I have a drink of yours? And it's pretty much like that in all of life. I mean, what sports team do you thirst after? You a Steelers or a Cowboys or a Colts fan? Are your kids also? You play basketball when you were in high school? Your kids do too, perhaps? Or as a parent, you love the outdoors, camping or hiking or farming. Where did that hunger and thirst come from? Was it passed down from your parents? Do you see it, friends? If we delight in something, if we taste and declare it good, then our children will ask, what's that? And then they'll taste it and say, mmm, that's good. So the truth is, church family, We can't pass on what we don't have. If a love for God is not in our hearts, as Moses says, then we cannot impress it on the next generation. And if your child is not hungry for God's word, the truth is it's probably because you're not taking the time out of your busy schedule to put God's word on your plate. Listen, friends, put God's word on your plate and then delight in it. And when you wake up or as you go about your day, coming and going, and then as you lie down at night, Delight in God's word, and it will be a delight for your children. 
Jeremiah 15, 16 says, When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. Lastly, how do we teach? How do you teach a child to live with eternity in mind? You know, in last week's message, and this one combined, we've already shared a lot of ways on how to successfully pass on the baton of faith. I mean, we've already looked at a lot of examples, like like make a priority to have your kids in church. Surround them with Christian people, young and old, like neighborhood groups are very helpful in that. Fill your home with God's word. Bible on the end table, Christian music in the car and in the home, Christian videos for kids on TV, pictures of faith on the walls, pictures of missionaries that you're praying, for pictures of compassion children that you're supporting all of them on the refrigerator scripture on the doorways the point is you are to saturate your children with your love for god and god's word and all that is good all that is good but the best answer to the question of how am i to teach is by personal example give them an example to look up to It was Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe in the mid-1800s, that wrote the short story, The Great Stone Face. And the story goes that one afternoon when the sun was going down, a mother and her little boy sat at the door of their cottage, and they were talking about the great stone face. For they had only to lift up their eyes, and up there at the top of the great mountain, clearly for all to see, though miles away, was the great stone face, with the sunshine brightening all of its features. The great stone face, there for all to see, sitting among a series of lofty mountains, and far below, a valley so spacious that it contained thousands upon thousands of inhabitants. Some lived in cabins up on the hillside, some lived in houses down in rich farmland, and still others congregated in the villages and towns where business was done and factories produced the needed products. But make no mistake, of all the people that had grown up in that grand valley, young and old alike, They were all graced with kind of a familiarity with the great stone face. You see, the great stone face was a work of nature. It was a formation of large rocks which were positioned naturally in such a way that when viewed from a proper distance, they resembled the feature of a human face, a man, and a very noble-looking man at that. I mean, there was the broad arch of the forehead a hundred feet high, the nose with its long bridge and the vast lips, which if they were to speak, they surely would roll down, those words would surely roll down the mountain like thunder. Now, it was a good thing for the children to grow up in the adulthood in that happy valley, for the great stone face was always there before their eyes. For all its features were noble, and the expression on the face so grand and yet so compassionate, as it were the warm glow from a heart that had only love for the people of the land below. Well, as the story began, there sat a mother with her little boy, gazing at the great stone face, and the child's name was Ernest. Mother, the little child, said, I wish it could speak, for it looks very kind and pleasant. I think if I were to see such a man, I would love him dearly. Well, said his mother, there is an old prophecy that if it should come to pass, we may see a man just with such a face one day. What do you mean, mother? Please tell me about it. So she told him an old story one that her mother had told her when she was a little girl, a story so old it was told by many many generations before by their forefathers. And it was a story not of things in the past, but a story of things yet to come. And the just of the story was this, that one day a child would be born in that valley, whom when grown was destined to become the greatest and noblest person of his time, whose face would bear the exact, exact resemblance of the great stone face. Well, when she had finished telling the story, it was easy to see that it had made quite the impression on her little boy, for Ernest clapped his hands and shouted, Oh, I do hope I shall see him. And in the days and years to come, Ernest never forgot that story that his mother told him, for it was always on his mind. And every time he would look up to gaze upon that great stone face, which was pretty much all the time, he would ponder in his mind, What kind of a man would that great stone face man be? Well, time passed by, and Ernest grew up, and while other young men left the valley to go to the towns and the cities to make their way, Ernest remained. He had no grand school to go to, no famous teacher to teach, save that great stone face. And so now a young lad, he humbly worked in the fields, looked up at that great stone face, and tried to live a life that he envisioned such a noble man would live. 
And so this story goes. As Ernest grew older and, and aged as a man, from time to time, rumors of a man uh, you know, made their way through the valley, that indeed the prophecy of the great stone face had been fulfilled. And many people in his part of the valley thought the rumors to be true. I mean, first it was a wealthy old businessman, and Ernest was excited as they paraded the man through the countryside. He couldn't wait to see his face. But when he saw the man's old wrinkled face with lips drawn tight and no sign of compassion to be seen, Ernest knew immediately it was not he. Although the people shouted his name and claimed, yes, he's the great stone face. But in time, it was revealed, as it so often is over time, that no, no, it is not he. Then more years passed, and Ernest was now in his thirties, perhaps, still living the humble, quiet life, doing whatever he could to live a good life that would benefit the community, things that he imagined the man with the great stone face would do. When once again a rumor arose, there is a man that may be that man, a man they called the great stone face, and this time it was a great general back from the war. But at one glance at his face, Ernest knew right away what the people would later discover. No, no, it was not he. He is not the great stone face. Years later, there would be another, and then another, and then finally, a great poet came through the countryside, and the rumor spread once again. But this time, even the poet himself confessed, No, no, it is not me. And so the years passed, and no others emerged. But Ernest, as he aged, never gave up hope. As he lived out his life, he could often be seen, always looking up, always gazing upon that great stone face, wondering, even aspiring to, what that man would be if he ever came into their valley. Years later, the people in the valley all agreed. The life of service to the community he lived, the words of inspiration he often spoke, surely it had happened. The prophecy had come true, for Ernest was the great stone face. So, how best can we teach the next generation church family? We teach by personal example. Give them an example to look up to. Give them an example to aspire to. Give them a hero. And may that hero be you. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 said to the disciples that he taught, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. May those who follow find us faithful.